Memcached is a simple in-memory key value store written in C. Uh, it was originally, I think, written in Perl and then rewritten in C. This is back in 2003. So it's been a while. And it has been popular with uh, companies such as Facebook, Netflix, Wikipedia. Facebook, I think, pushed it to its uh, limit, you know. And the most, uh, and the reason it's why popular is because of its simplicity. And we're gonna talk about that. I know we throw the word simple a lot these days, but Memcached is truly simple. I mean, if you're looking for advanced features, it's not here. It was designed to be simple, solve the problems of the web back in 2003, which is we wanna help alleviate the queries to the database. We're, we're you know, we're, we're, the databases are taking a hit, you know, so let's cache things. Although I usually do not agree with having a cache to solve a slow query, because I think personally, I think it's a cop out, you know, to, to just add a cache when you have a slow query. You have to understand why it's slow. You have to understand why it exactly is taking time, why there are a lot of logic reads and how to minimize it. And that's another story for another day. But sometimes you need a cache, of course, right? And then Memcached was born, right? Of course, there are alternatives such as Redis. I made a video about it. But this video is to the crash course of Memcached. We're going to dive into the agenda here. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, there will be uh, chapters where you can jump into the interesting part of the things, but it's an in-memory database. We're going to talk about memory management. You might say, why? Well, we're going to find out. Memory management's not easy at all. You know, it's not just like, hey, just throw things in memory and then read it. Eh, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Okay, I talk about the LRU, the least recently used, uh, which was designed to avoid uh, growing the memory of this instance unlimitedly, right? Because you have to have a some sort of a, a mechanism to evict all the entries that has been never used. That's why you cannot really rely on memcached to have a value always there. It was never the goal of this cache, right? Unlike Redis. Redis, if you if you start something, it's going to be there, and you told it to be there forever, it's going to stay forever. It will make sure to stay forever. Memcached does not guarantee that. And you can argue that this is actually a feature, and you can argue that this is something you don't want, you yeah? know? So, tread lightly. Thread, we're gonna talk about the threading model because you have to have multiple threads uh, if you wanna serve a lot, a lot, a lot of clients with a lot, a lot, a lot of TCP connection connected to this thing. Read and write, we're gonna go through examples of a read, example for the write, and okay, gonna uh, open the hood and look what is inside this beautiful thing. Locking model, obviously, uh, two people trying to write into the same item. It's not as advanced as ACID, obviously, where you have isolation levels. No, it's a serialized model where we try not to have two people read the same item at the same time or write uh, the same item at the same time. So locking. And we're going to talk about the, the old model and the new model. That's where you really try to understand what how things are built is completely different from the way we explain it distributed cache i know they say it's a distributed cache but i kind of don't like to say that because in itself memcached is not distributed it's just when you spin up a memcached instance three memcached instances they don't know about each other and they will never be right? The client is responsible for the distribution. So I kind of reluctant to say it's a distributed cache. I know people call it a distributed cache. I don't like to do that. But hey, it is a distributed cache if you, if you, if you put the distribution on the client side. And I think this is part of the beautiful, simple design. They, they, on purpose, they didn't make it distributed to make it simple. And then we're going to go through a demo. We're going to use Docker because you can spin up a lot of instances in, in Docker really easily. Let's do that. So, in memory key value store, what's that really? Uh, we're going to talk about some terminology here uh, specific to memcached. An item, that's what they call it. An item is really what uh, consists of a key and a value. A key is usually should be unique, right? And a value could be literally anything. A key has to be a string. 
and it maxed out at 250 character. You can see the limits, right? That's why I think uh, Redis kind of won the cash game when it comes to this thing, because Memcached has a lot of limits, and uh, this kind of, uh, you know, crippled some people from using this cash because of these limits, right? But you can argue also the simplicity of this design, and if you can work around the the design to use Memcached, it, it's actually pretty nice, right? Because when when they say key as a string, they did that for a simplicity reason. To right, if you if you support like dates uh, or or I don't know like blobs as keys, then things become really complicated. And the shows and the architecture, and if there is a bug, it's really hard to track down, right? And the value can be any type. Uh, it's by default one megabyte. Again, another limitation in Memcached. You, know, I, I, you can see that I, I talk about limitation, but these limitations, technically to me, I, I see them as features, you know, because they didn't claim to be like the best in the world. They said, hey, we are designed to be simple. And I appreciate and I completely love that. You know, when you say I want to build something simple, the simple thing has limitations, right? The simple thing will, by design, have limitation when you look at the big picture, right? It's not going to have, like, tons of features, right? So, yeah, you can configure this to, to increase it. But, again, it's not really a good idea all the time. Uh, keys have expiration date, TTLs, right? Time to lives. And uh, even that, don't rely on that, right? Even if you put, like, a key that has, like, a one hour, and your memory is filled, the LRU will can kick in, and if you never use that key, it's gonna get affected. And they tell you that, man. Hey, Memcached is a transient. We're not gonna make sure that it's actually persisted. It's not supposed to be that, right? Again, we'll, go, we'll always go back to the, the requirements here. They never meant, right, for this to be a persisted cache forever, right? You don't rely on that. You can use it to help you avoid expensive queries. But yeah, be ready at any time that this value is not going to be there. Everything is stored in memory, right? That's by design, cache, memcached. Again, don't confuse memcached with memcached DB. That's a completely different project. And I think it's abandoned since 2009, right? But yeah, memcached is still going and Facebook. And I think uh, Mark Zuckerberg gave a presentation about memcached as well as at some point how they tuned it to its maximal values let's talk about memory management here's the memory right when you allocate items you know when you say hey i want to allocate an array and i allocate an integer and i will allocate uh here's a block of memory you know these items that you allocate and even your new program today they're gonna go in random places now they yes the process has a dedicated memory area but when you allocate these things go random so the grain is allocated they're going to go to random places right yeah initially they might be consequent but as you uh, remove and free items you're going to end up with these gaps so you might say well, what's wrong with these gaps the problem is like this is called the fragmentation What's wrong with fragmentation? Well, you're going to have like a little bit, a few bytes here, a few bytes here, a few bytes here, a few bytes here. But if you want like a big bulk of memory location consequent, let's say you want one meg, you have one meg, but it's fragmented. And guess what? If it's fragmented, you cannot use it. You cannot just allocate here. Oh, my part and the next part here and this part here. I think the, the operating system allows you to do that, maybe. But then it will, it will thrash left and right to collect what you have right we had the same problem with hard drive i guess right back in the days or fragmentation where the the seek you know the the needle has to to go multiple places to fetch your files because it's a circle right this this disk and has the if, if you store a file and you start editing the file the files will go to multiple sectors and to read that file back you have to go sector one sector two this was to, supposed to be like a, a rotating disk. I failed miserably. But you get a point, right? So memory fragmentation is bad. We try to avoid it, right? New items can, on, can no longer fit. So what, what did they do? So memcached at least, what they did is they allocate pages in a state, even if they don't use it. They say, hey, when you start, allocate a whole page, one meg. Again, 
That's that's the design, right? The, that's the reason why we have one value up to one megabyte. You cannot go beyond that. So they say, hey, let's start with the one meg. So if they allocate, they allocate a one meg, the whole thing. They don't use it. Technically, to the operating system, you, the cache has used one megabyte. It doesn't know it, right? That it's not actively using it. The clients, us connecting to memcached, we're not probably, we're using a like part of that memory. Does that make sense? But this avoids fragmentation, right? Because now all of this, is just one big page with a lot of empty space, right? But it is allocated. And then there is this idea of chunks, right? So the pages are broken down into equal size of what they call chunk. So um, keep these in mind, the terminology in mind. The chunk is a fixed size. And what determines the chunk size is actually something called the slab class, right? And uh, the slab is, think of a slab. Every time I hear the word slab, I remember Dark Souls, you know, it's a video game where you have the last item that you require in order to upgrade your weapon. It's called the Titanite Slab, where it's just like really large rock that you use in order to upgrade your weapon. It's, a, it's, it's basically a, a, a big thing, a slab of meat, they say, right? It's just a big thing. That's what it means. So this idea of slab and slab classes will always show up here. So it's like a big portion of memory. A slab class is what defines the chunk size, right? So there is, there will be a slab class of uh, 40 bytes. There is, will be a slab class of a one meg. So the chunk sizes will be 44 bytes, right? And the chunk sizes for a slab class of that type is one meg. So we're gonna show an example to, to, to show that of stuff. And the pages consist of fixed chunk size, right? Items are stored in chunks. Here's the, the very important item. So your item, will be stored in the chunk. Your chunk size can be, let's say, uh, 100 bytes, right? If it's 100 bytes and your item, which includes the key and the value, is less than 100, you're going to include the whole chunk, right? So if it's 90 bytes, you lost 10 bytes within that chunk. Nothing to do about it. Sorry. Right? That's one limitation here. So there, there will be a free space, a tiny free space in the chunk. And obviously, each slab class has a fixed chunk size. So that's how they are determined. It's going to be clear as we go through that. Obviously, uh, avoid memory fragmentation. Here's an example, right? So here we have a slab class with a chunk size of 72 and uh, subclass 1. And slab class 43, uh, for example, the chunk size is 1 meg. So you have in a single page, right? So slab class have multiple pages. And sometimes they call them also these called slabs. The word slab in the documentation is so overloaded and I've seen people use it one over the other. So I avoid using it, the word slab. So a slab class and their pages, right? So this page, in this case, we said one meg, right? And the chunk size 72 divided, that means we have 14,563 chunks per page, but each chunk is 72 byte, right? So if you have an item around 72 byte, fits nicely in this. Okay. But if your item is larger, let's say 900K, then, oh, it doesn't fit this slab class. So we need to, uh, let's, uh, let's find out what is the subclass for this item. Oh, subclass 43, because the closest one meg. And guess what? The one, <laughs> the one meg class, sub slab class, has this entire page is one chunk, right? So this is really important to understand here right so that's how they allocate memories this is, we're looking at the internal architecture of uh, memcached here all right let's go for an example I, new item 40 byte 40 byte the closest thing is this guy right slab class one let's allocate memory and then boom no we don't allocate memory that this memory is already allocated right we just store the item right in this chunk and then we start adding pointers and stuff like that here so now our item is right here and we're going to talk about the hash table and stuff like that but this is just again memory management let's say i have a new item 900k oh this fits right here so one big chunk in one page right so that's interesting let's say another a new item 40 bytes but guess what slab class a uh, slab class one because that's the what the chunk size is 
fits it nicely. But guess what? We have two pages. They are all completely full. So I cannot insert this. What do we do? Create a brand new page. Put that thing here. Does that make sense? So we allocate a new page. And when you go to the demo, we're going to see all this stuff, right? We're going to do a stats and see like, oh, how number of pages allocated is this, right? So it's just, I, I absolutely love how they did this. It's interesting. Obviously, does it, does it have limitation? Of course. But you're going to see that depends on the sizes of the item, you say. And once you really understand how things work you're you can architect your application specifically the back end here front end doesn't really talk to memcached at all right the back end here can be architected so that you can choose the perfect items right to fit this entire thing right you're not gonna just choose haphazardly right that's how you know your craft effectively all right let's get to the meat lru least recently used you know the main problem with memory is it's limited you know and even if memcached allocated a certain amount of memory if you store a lot a lot a lot of keys even with good expiration date memory can get full what do you do do you block new inserts i would say that's that's one feature that you can add i suppose but but memcached they don't allow you to do they won't let you go to that state you know if the memory is be about to be full then anything that hasn't been used for a very long time they will release it that's another reason where memcached is a transient memory it do not rely on a key even if you set the expire for an hour do not rely to that key to be to be there in an hour it can go any time right that's another limitation that's another feature right I, I say limitation and a feature at the same time because it is it is a feature right and it's, it's to some people it's a limitation and how do they do that right they use something called the link list have you ever heard about this before at 20 years ago 21 years ago uh in the university i took a course on the cs uh, cs 101 they talked about linked list and that is pretty much the only time in all my entire professional career i ever used a linked list <laughs> that's probably i'm not saying that's just the case with my the application i wrote is all high level languages i never had to write a database or a memcache you know so i never used the linked list right so doesn't doesn't mean that it's it's a useless structure it's, but it is it's an important data structure why because the least recently used is a linked list. There is a head and there is a tail. And every item is linked to each other. So if all these items that you add are the, in this architecture, right? They are in the linked list. And there is every slab class has its own LRU, right? So if I, for example, access an item that is, happens to be in the tail, it will be popped and go back to the head. So there is a cost to accessing an item. There is a cost. There is a cost of removing this chain, put it that back, point the head to this, point this guy to this guy, point this guy to this guy. That's how you do a link list, right? So every time you access an item, it goes back to the head. So items that are not used, they will automatically be pushed down to the tail. And if the memory is out of uh, reach, basically, these items will be removed from the tail. But also another thing with uh, with this link list is like with threads if you with which memcached is is a multi-threaded app how can you have multiple threads read at the same items right you can't you have to lock this structure you know if people who done multi-threading you have to you have to lock it right and the moment you do locking if you if you know about something about databases which i i tease a course on database engineering Check out, check it out. It's actually right here, database.husseinnasser.com. I talk about all this stuff, you know, in details, in fundamental details. You know, so don't expect like SQL syntaxes in my courses, not like that. Right? I talk about fundamentals, which you then build up and see how the client is built out. Right. But yeah, locks is a very critical concept here. You have to lock it to avoid this, you know, mutation, you know, corruption. But yeah, it's a cost. And there is an 
allow you claw crawler and a demon that does the cash eviction from the tail right and again every time it kicks out have to lock and the, if it's locked people cannot read people threads cannot read and if threads cannot read latency right block slow right all of this you gotta understand when things happen this is why and i'm gonna share my opinion about the lru right and I think this is a good time. By the way, there is an LRU cache per slab class. I think I mentioned that. So the one meg slab class, right, which has like pages of one meg and the chunk sizes of one meg has its own LRU and each other sub slab class has its own LRU. By the way, I, I don't make, I'm, I'm making any of this up. I'm, I had to read, frankly, maybe 20 different documents to collect this information and, and kind of present it in a summarized manner here, right? Because there is no one doc to explain all that, unfortunately, right? It's, it's not incomplete, unfortunately. That's what I noticed. And outdated. So my opinion about the LRU, in my, in my personal humble opinion, is I wish Memcached actually disabled this by default, you know? LRU is a feature, right? And they, uh, the reason they added it, because memory is limited, especially back in 2003 when they first built this thing, memory was so scarce or scarce. Is it scarce or scarce? Scarce, right? It's very limited. And when you do that, you don't want to run out of memory, right? So if you allocate certain amount of memory for memcached, it can easily run out, right? If you have a lot of keys. So how do you manage that? They say, hey, we're going to remove, we're going to build an LRU. Least recently items kick, get kicked out from my memory. That's a fine, but I wish they disabled that by default or give us an option to disable it because the overhead of managing an LRU, and you can see from the papers I'm going to reference, is so large. The locks that they have to maintain slows down throughput, right? And, compl and complicate the application. So I think they stuck whoever built this 2000 in 2003 memcached brad fitzpatrick who is the original developer of memcached he built this for his website live journal you know i wish he disabled this by default i really wish because his original design is so simple and so elegant i absolutely love it you know you build something so simple with its features stripped there are no much features lru made it not simple unfortunately yeah, cool. Have as a feature, but disable by, by default. Or have an option to disable. I don't know if there's an option to disable. Maybe there is. But hey, I want to take the responsibility as a client. Right? If I'm going to allocate certain amount of memory because I'm responsible, I'm going to give uh, memcached 5 gig, 10 gig, and my application is smart enough to know to set expiry date, right? for this item. And yeah, if I'm going to get errors, if it's filled out, it's on me. I want to delete an items. I want to do this management this way for 95% of the users who want simple things, they're going to get it. Allow you in my personal opinion, again, this is just my personal opinion. You can agree or disagree. I think should have, this, ha should, this should have been disabled because now they they created a new LRU, which is like has hot and warm and cold and, and they move stuff around because they have a lot of problems with LRU. Like moving stuff around all the time is so expensive, you know? So it, it has a cost. So let us just, how about, eh, give me an option not to use it and go back to a simple model of course I, I don't i don't mind if two items two users try to access the same two threads trying to access the same item at the same time let them be serialized that's fine right but lru as a whole thing i think it's, a, it's just to me over engineering that's just my opinion you can disagree here is how it looks like by the way lru in the big picture again this is all drawings i made it uh I could be wrong in small details because I don't I don't know the actual architecture. So this is I derived these from reading the source code and the doc. So this is how it looks like. So this is this is where you talk about the pages, right? And the chunks. So the chunks or the items is what being uh, LRU'd, right? So the head is right here, and this is linked to this item, this link to this item, this link to this item, this link to this, this is the tail. So this is how it looks like. Every item 
here is actually linked to the next to the one next to it right this is think this the, of this as a snapshot after many many usages right gets and red the so so things will move to the head and to the tail obviously i didn't draw every particular thing because it's going to be a mess of a drawing but you get the point right it does that that's how they allow you and you can see how complex things get so let's talk about threading so this is one of the, my favorite parts uh, i know uh, i absolutely have uh, i absolutely love networking and if you're interested i have a networking course and and this part is all about sockets connections the way listeners work the way the tcp connection works I talk this about this in detail in my network course. If you're interested, go to network.hasainnasr.com. Learn more about that. Net, again, network.hasainnasr.com. This URL redirects it immediately to Udemy with the latest coupon applied. So uh, you're going to get a discount and you're going to be supporting this channel, this work. Thank you so much. There is, here is the threading model for uh, for MMcached, right? Because it accepts clients, it has to have networking, right? So what they do is they listen on a TCP port, right? So that means they support transmission control protocol. That's the native transport that they support. They also support UDP, which I didn't mention here, but UDP has been now disabled by default because of an attack that happened four years ago, 2018, a reflection attack actually, right? With, with Memcached public servers. So there was the Cloudflare actually reported that. So UDP has been disabled by default. But yeah, you can use it if you want. But yeah, let's stick with TCP right now. TCP port 11211. And there is a listener thread. So one th spend up listener, one thread that spins up, it listens to port 11211. So that creates a, a socket, right? In the operating system speak, right? And that basically creates its own accept queue, its own send queue. This is how the applications start accepting connection, right? So everything, every single connection that is happening, the listener thread will accept it. So there is a loop, infinite loop here. Literally all application has this loop where it's constantly accepting uh, connections. One thread, right? So all the connections goes to this thread. So once it accepts the connection, it gets the file descriptor, we call it, right? Which actually represents the connection. And now what, what Memcached does is spins up a new thread, gives that file descriptor to that thread. Now, if a stream of data, if a request to get a key was sent to this connection, it will the operating system knows to send it to this thread. Well, technically what happens is the thread pulls the file descriptor, right? This is a, now, this thread is responsible for this connection. This thread is responsible for this connection. This thread is responsible for this connection. So you can see that <laughs> now this model just blows up, right? If a, one connection per thread, if you have so many connections, you can rather run out of threads, right? Or that kind of also bloats your memory and CPU. So be careful with that as well. I think they put a limit to the number of connections, Memcached. I might be wrong there. But yeah, so this is basically explains all of that. Now, the moment you have threading, now the beauty here is you don't have bottleneck, right? If you have one thread that is responsible for all the connections and listening, you, you will be blocked, right? One user will send a key and then another user will send a key. They won't be served, right? They have to be serialized because there is one thread actually executing them one by one, right? But here, if one user executes a, sends a key request to get a key, and this guy want to write, they can happen at the same time, right? This thread will read it, and this thread will read it. They are different processing. This could be in a core, this could be in a completely different core. That could be also possible. Versus it's one thread, then becomes really a, a problem. So we had to go with multi-threads. What's the problem with that? Well, <laughs> the problem is these threads will try to access what we call the LRU and the items and the memory. So everything is shared between all these threads, but you can't have two threads right to the same location. That's a problem. That's why the original design had one global lock. It was serialized. So in this case, yeah, the threads kind of helped 
with the connection, but, but you were serialized at the locking model. So nobody can even access two different items. Has nothing to do with each other. They were serialized. They were locked. So one thread has to be served after the other. They, for, they fixed that. They completely revamped that. Now it's a pair item lock. So if two threads start to access the same item, then it will be setting else. That's good. That's okay. I'm okay with that, right? But yeah, if I am accessing item one, key number one, and then another thread access to key number two at the same time, they should be served at the same time. Well, there is no reason for locking. And the only reason we lock is because we want to update the LRU. Again, so there is so much stuff that comes back always to the LRU. It's like, oh my, really? We, did we really need an LRU? Why, what if we disabled by default, right? Okay, that's good, just me. Let's go through an example. A read. And this is something we never talked about here, which is the hash table. If you think about it, if you have a key, how do you actually find where this key lives, right? If you think about it. You need hash tables. Yeah. So what do you do? And I talked about the hash table in my YouTube channel. Uh, look up hashing and consistent hashing. I talk about details. Hash table is nothing but an associative array. It's really just an array. And the beauty of an array is if you have an array, right? Let's talk about it, arrays a little bit. If you have an array from, an array has to be consecutive. If you allocate an array of a thousand elements, accessing element number seven Accessing element number 1024 or 1023 is big O of one, is fast because you know the index. And once you know the index, you know the head of the array, you add the address to the index, voila, you have the address and the memory of the CPU can immediately go to that location. That's the beauty. You have an index. With hash tables, you don't have an index, you have a key. The trick is to convert the key back to an index. That is all what it is, a hash table nothing fancy it's just an array so we take that what we do is the do a hash on the key right let's say i'm gonna read test key right and then do a hash and then do modulo n where n is the size of this array or the hash table right and then we, we, you're gonna get a value between zero and n minus one i guess right so now okay let's go on point it and that's big o of one plus the cost of the hash right now you got here found it now, what you do is you're going to get a pointer which takes you to the page on that specific slab class for that item, which is happened to be D in this case. That's how a read works. So it's a big O of one. You can argue that this is one read and this is a second read. Yeah, I suppose that works too, right? I think the, the new model have kind of two hash tables, if I'm mistaken, but I couldn't find detailed docs about this, so I explained this. So apologies if this is a little bit out of date. But this gives you the idea here. The new two hashes, I think uh, they were provided to provide a pair item lock. And obviously, what happened here is, this is the LRU. You access the item, the D is pushed to the head. Right? So now you have A, B, C, D. A is now the least recently used item, is in the tail. And A points to B, B points to C, C points to D, and obviously it's a reverse length as well. So D points to C, C points to B, P point to A. Right? So that's how the LRU. Actually, what do you, if you think about it, the, the pointers are right here in the item itself. right? But I drew it this way for simplicity, otherwise it's not readable at all. Read to... This is another example for read. I'm going to read buzz. Hash the buzz. Get the in. Whoa. Get the item. Boop. Get a C. Nice. Now when we read a C, the C is pushed to the head. D is slightly pushed. And then obviously the LRU is updated. And that's another lock, right? You have to do a lock to do that. So if buzz and whatever the value before a test was read at the same time, they are serialized at the LRU level if they belong to the same slab class. Again, this might have changed with the new architecture. They changed that a little bit. So I think that you can you can play with that a little bit. But again, to update the LRU, you have to you have to kind of acquire a lock. So you're gonna be serialized right here. Yeah. Let's go through a write. I'm gonna write key new of a value with 44 whopping bytes. Let's do that. Well, to write, we need to obviously find the hash, right? Where to write it? Hash, modular in, get that puppy, 
find where to write it oh happen to be an empty location sure that's good right and now you have questions what if what if i happen to have something that is already written you can you can have collisions and we're going to talk about collisions in a minute right it's a problem of hash tables hash tables are fun and good but the moment they you run into collisions and you want to resize it it falls apart but now i create a new pointer this pointer now i need to allocate a slab class not a slab class i need to allocate a, a chunk we're gonna put my item in and that chunk goes into a specific slab class well 44 bytes pick a slab class right and even the slab classes guys by the way it's not really fixed you can play with those the other configuration called the chunk the chunk factor growth size i'm not gonna mention it here it's just gonna make the course a little bit longer but you you get the point there are so many tweaking you can play with right tweak these chunk sizes but yeah I look at a new memory location in this specific page in an empty page in a fit a fitting chunk right because you want to pick a chunk that is almost fits right in the chunk right not too small obviously cannot be larger than the chunk size so have to fit right into it right but then that's the the that's what the what memcached does all right let's spice things up let's say i'm gonna write a key called nanny which is a new key i don't have it before and value 44 but it happened to clash with another existing key because that's hashes always do that right so when you do that you hash nanny and it happened to be fitting on a entry that already have a pointer what do we do do we overwrite it no what they did is this is called a bucket by the way right they add more item to the bucket you know we have one item let's call it i don't know test or something all right and then we have nanny which fits right in the same bucket what we do is just we make it into a chain this chain of buckets right actually one bucket with two items i don't know right whatever the terminology doesn't really matter you just read to understand let's turn back the laser here and yeah we're gonna add it here and then just do the pointer and do the do your thing now obviously we need to talk about a collision what happened to a collision i want to read the key nanny right go here hash it obviously go here oh we have two which one ah that's the cost you have to go one by one through all of them right why because now you have a hash you don't know one of which one of these are actually nanny. What you do is read the first one, right? Check it, compare the key. Oh, because if you go to the item, you're gonna find the actual key, right? That's stored here. So you're gonna find it and say, oh, that's not nanny, that's something else, right? Let's go through the bucket. Go to the next one. There you go. That's my item. So here is a completely different paper that you can write here. This P people take phds on this stuff by the way guys you know this is called the uh, the the scale factor you know memcached measures this growth and if it's too much based on a certain percentage if you're overloading then then you're gonna see performance problems right reading a key is gonna have to go through multiple reads to find the actual key versus if it goes right here hey the key is right here of course there's one entry it has to be it right but if there is multiple, yeah, then it's a problem, right? I mean, you can you can think about it. You can argue that you can hash a key that happened to get to a value that is not there. So technically, you have to read it and compare because your key might not exist, but it happened to hash to a value that it does, right? So you have to read it. So there is a cost to reading. So that's the problem of hash table. So and if that's the case, then they do a hash resize. And boy, when you rehash your table, they have to shift everything around. And I believe this is when they use the consisting hashing, which is this ring concept, which I talked about in another video. And that just gets really complicated, right? Because they now, now, the moment you resize your hash table, you need to move stuff around. Because Nanny will not be this index number one anymore. It's going to be index number 700, something like that, right? 1700 is not a number i think i'm gonna skip this because we talked about locking in a minute right, we talked about thre threads and then accessing the lru and how 
it was a global lock and then it changed to a pair item lock and then still we have a ref counting you know every time you read an item you increase the ref count you know and when you release it you decrement the risk count this is for so the garbage collection can the garbage collection is written in c there is no garbage collector but the the the, the ephemeral application level garbage collection when all lr you kick in can remove the item because you cannot just remove the item if if someone is referencing it that's the definition of memory, memory leaks right all right let's talk about distributed cache and how it's uh, memcache is actually not a distributed cache in my opinion memcache d servers when you spin up a memcache d server memcache d server they are completely isolated you cannot link a server to another server there is no mechanism to do that right when you spin up a memcache d server it's a memcached server. It doesn't talk to another servers. And I absolutely love this design. How simple and elegant this is. Put the responsibility. If you want to do distributed, well, the APIs at the client side has to do that. And that's what we're going to show in the in the code section where we're going to write our own. Uh, we're going to use a, a Node.js application to do that. Oh, of course, we're going to use also Telnet to connect to that and write stuff, right? But I'm going to go through all this stuff now. But yeah, what happens here is the client actually knows about all the servers. It has knowledge. So the client side actually does the distribution, right? So it's like, okay, key number one, go here. Key number two, go here. Key number three, go here. So there is a hashing going on, consistent hashing to be specific. You can build your own memcached client that does whatever you want, right? And then distribute that stuff. Well, what happened if I if I add a, if I add a server? Well, your client can start distributing the keys. I would definitely not be with that because why would you distribute the keys for in a transient cache anyway? Who cares? Add a server is like oh yeah. If if the key is not there, you're gonna query the database and pull it up, right? It's it, it's not worth it to do this this chattiness to move items for around from one server to another that's just a bad idea i don't know if clients do it maybe they do but i don't think it's re it's required it's just thrashing for the case thrashing database sharding again you you might if you know this channel you know that i'm i tried as much as possible to push it as the last resort i do not like distributed stuff especially so complex to deal with right i like simplicity i'm a simple man right but yeah sometimes you go you have you go to the youtube scale and google scale then you don't have a choice one machine cannot possibly handle everything i would i would go with raid replicas i would go with partitioning horizontal partitioning in the server itself minimize that as much as possible i would go with raid you know d distributed disk storage but the application rem remain as a single writer the moment you have multiple writers and you have to deal with the sharding it becomes really complex you know if you want to deal with the complicity complexity sure but yeah that's that's the idea of distributed cache okay let's do a demo we're gonna do a demo we're gonna spin up a bunch of memcached docker instances so for this exercise you just install docker and you're good to go and you have to have a docker uh you have to have a docker account because somehow they are locked behind an account memcached i have no idea why they, they, they did do they do that sometimes right so you just create an account do a docker login you're good to go right once you do that you can download the image and you can spin up as many memcached instances as you want so we're gonna do that i'm gonna use telnet because i love the simplicity of memcached you know how many clients these days that you can actually just telnet and run comments to they can be counted on one finger you know they don't exist anymore the simplicity is gone from these from today's applications right the good old days of you just telling it and run and uh, one thing i didn't mention is memcached doesn't have security by default so that might be a, bre a deal breaker for you right so you have to you can implement authentication which doesn't exist by default sassel i believe they call it you can implement tls if you want but by default they don't have any of that stuff right 
So take it with a grain of salt, right? It's, they say, they said simple. It is simple, right? But you have to be careful in a cloud environment when it comes to Memcached. You have to TLS it, right? They support that. There is a support for that. And obviously, we're going to use Node.js memcached for this consistent hashing. And I'm going to put all our Docker containers in and play with that a little bit. How about we do that? So I have Docker installed here on my Mac. You can have Windows and install Docker on top of it. You can have Linux and install Docker on top of it. That's why I always like to use Docker. It's just, it's an agnostic. Whether, whether, whatever your application is, you know, whatever your operating system, Docker works, you know. We have it on top of all of this stuff. So let's go ahead and spin up a docker container that have a memcached instance one memcached instance right so docker run you do dash dash name let's give it a name uh it's called m1 memcached or mem1 right you don't have to give it a name but i like that so that we can find it and delete it later easily and then you can expose the port uh by default 11211 right 11211 so this is what is running in the container this is what is exposed in my host right because i'm gonna hit my host which is hussein mac which is that's the actual host that is running docker and then i'm gonna hit that port which will be port forwarded to this con container and i'm gonna spin up another one with one one two one 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 two one two and one one two one three right later we're gonna spin up multiple ones and then finally we're gonna do a mim cache d right if you do just like that this will block the uh the terminal you know and it's gonna be just work so i i suggest you do that first i know it's gonna work for me because i i did it before but i like to do dash d right dash d means just hey detach it because i'm gonna use this terminal for something else later right so just go just like that we created a container you can do docker ps to make sure that the container is running obviously if the image is not there it's gonna download it for you and you have to do docker login to do all that stuff so do all of that log into your account and uh yeah. all that stuff all right so let's test it out how do you test it telnet what are we telling it into hussein mac which is my host and which port 11211 again this is the port that i exposed that happened to be the same doesn't have to right if i do that all of a sudden i'm logged in how do i do that well let's do a stats give me your stats and this is the stuff that most of the stuff here we talked about currently right uptime what's the version of memcached d the pointer size maximum number of connections 1024 we talked about that right there's a maximum number of connections uh how many times you run a get how many times you run a set how many times you incremented uh the threads how many threads you have here right eviction how many times the lr you kicked in and evicted stuff and then you can do like stats uh, slabs i think which are going to give you like how many slabs were active how many is actually allocated obviously we don't have anything because we didn't do anything right so let's go ahead and set something so to set a key you do set and then you do the key, let's call it foo. And then um, the flags, zero. I don't have any flags here. Flags, you can do more further controls over here. And the second parameter here is the expiration. So let's say it's 3,600, which is an hour, right? You can set it for, for an hour. You can set it for a minute. You can set it for a second if you want, right? That's the expiration. So if your item ever get to, to after an hour, it will be evicted. It will not be returned to you not necessarily will be evicted until the LRU kicks in and that actually physically removes it, right? And then finally, we're going to uh, put the data length. How 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 big is the value that you're going to set? Let's say two characters here, right? So I'm going to do high. You have to exactly match it, right? <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to be, uh, it's not going to fit nicely, right? So now we store the value. So let's read that value. Give foo yay i know this is just very simple stuff but you get the point right you can you can uh increment you, you can you can delete that key right and if you delete it you can read that it's not there so very simple stuff i don't really care about the api I more i want most to talk about the architecture of stuff here right and that's what matters here there's there are actually two protocols right? command sets this is the old one and there's the new one, which is starts with MG, like two characters. And there's like a different set of syntax, right? There are two syntaxes here. Syntax. Can you say syntaxes? 
I, th I, I guess you do. You can. But you can play with this. It's very simple. You connect to that. And you see, I didn't log in. There is no accounts or anything like that. There is no collection that you create. It's just a free floating, right? Some people might like that. Some people might not like that because they want partitioning. Hey, let me create a table or collection. Let me play with that key value right there. So it's a it's a free for all. If I if I destroy this connection, so if I destroy it and I connect it again, right, and I do get foo. Obviously, it's not there because we deleted it. So if I set it again, um, black zero, I set it for ten seconds or, or two thousand seconds, whatever, and then to high stored get foo, right? If I killed it now, let's kill the session, right? Quit. And then do again connect and then get foo the value is still there obviously right because that uh, it's, it's stored in memory right even if i connect it as a different tcp connection right and now that we did that if you do stats slabs you can see some interesting values that we talked about here right the chunk size right so we have this number one which is this represents the slab class that we talked about Right? So we happen to have one slab class because my value is so tiny. And if I create another chunk with a large value, the large item, another slab class will be created and that will have its own configuration. So the chunks per page, which we talked about, 10,922, we have one page only. As we add items, we can just increase that if we want. How many is in use? One chunk. How many is free? 21 10921 so that's the total we used one how many time we read it how many time we said it how many time we deleted everything here is actually uh accounted for active slabs we have one slab right here effectively active and, and this is the memory allocated right so it's like what that's like uh one meg exactly right that's the meg that is allocated we talked about that so yeah, so you can start playing with that and add multiple data points and, and look at the stats and play with it a little bit. So let's control this and quit. So now that we talked about Tilnet, how about we actually go to Node.js and build our beautiful, interesting application here. All right, so I created this. I went to my projects folder here. I'm gonna go ahead and create a directly called Node Mem, right? And I'll just go ahead and do that, right? Do an npm init dash y, right? I have a Node.js, of, of course, installed right here to do all this stuff, right? And then um, let's create an index.js file. And we're going to do const mem cached equal, I believe it's just do require mem cached, literally. And that's the library we're going to install. So once we have this, library we can call it right how can i call it const um let's call it server and then we're going to create a new mem cached and here's the interesting thing you can pass in an array of servers and you can pass in a string you can pass in an array or you can pass an object if you pass an array then the uh the the keys will be evenly distributed between all these instances today i have only one server so hussein mac 11211 all right close the array we're going to add more servers later but that's that's it basically because server i guess server pool is a better name huh let's let's call it server pool it's because that's what it is it's a server pool here let's create a function called run and this function will be called in right and this function, we're going to use the server pool and we're going to set a value. So here's how you set a value. Set pool, uh, server pool dot set, and you give it a key. Say foo, right? And then the value bar, right? And then expiration day, an hour. And then the final one is a callback, which gives you like, in case of an error, I'm not going to set it because I trust that it's going to just work. So all we have to do is uh, do that. And this will just set the value. But for the sake of time, I'm going to actually set 10 values. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. For those who know JavaScript, we can do this trick like for each. I, I think you can do a better job at this than I will. But I think this works, right? <laughs> this, this should work, right? 
I like that, that. So they will have a different key, A, and the bar will have A. This way we'll set what? 10 values in this case. And each value will have the foo A, foo 1, and bar 1. Foo 2, bar 2. The reason I do this is because I want to actually see the value. I'm not going to read it from here. All of us are going to do that is just run. And I'm going to read it from telnet. Yeah? That's how I'm going to do it. Let's go ahead and do save. npm install memcache d. And then npm. That's it. Node index.js. Hopefully it runs. And of course, the moment I say that, I have an error. So let's go ahead and, and check the error here. So I'm going to see the, what the error is for each. So let's go ahead and just add that. Okay. This is going to print the error in case there is an error. Just in case. All right. Let's try it again. Node index.js. All right. Now it works. I had like a typo, so I had to fix. But let, look at this. Git full three, git full four, git full five. We're getting all the values. That is pretty cool, you guys, right? It's pretty cool. So here's what I'm going to do now. Let's control exit here. Quit. Here's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to spin up more containers. So I was going to do run dash dash name mem2, right? And they call it dash p 11212. 11211. Again, this is the actual port. Will this will not change? This is what's changing here, right? Right here, right? Detach memcache d. Right? Gotta do the same thing. Port three. Three. That is pretty neat, right? And uh for for sake of completing this add so four servers. Why? Servers are free. We can <laughs> we can spin up as much as we want. Now let's edit our application right here. And uh, what we're gonna do is literally just add a comma. So hey, Hussein Mac one one two one two is another server, right? There's another one too. Hussein Mac. All they are living in the same server. If you think about it, right? It's just different services, right? Jose Mac, 11214. That is awesome. Nothing changes, right? So I'm going to do it again. And then node index.js. And I want you to pay attention to what will happen now. The client app now distributed all the stuff to all the servers. So now my foos will be all over the place. Let's test it out. Tell net Jose and Mac, uh, 11212, right? Let's connect to 11212, the second server, and then git foo1. It's right there. Git foo2, not there. Git foo3, not, yeah, it's right there. Git foo4, it's not there. Get it? It's because it, now the distribution is up to the client. I have no idea how, how this is, will be distributed. Probably round robin, but uh, could be something else, right? So if I pick now another server, right? Three. Let's do that. Get foo one, not there. Get foo two, not there. Get foo three, not there. Get foo four, not there. Get foo five, right there. So it took us like five. Five is there, right? And and you get the idea. These keys are now distributed everywhere. And when you ask about it, now I'm going physically to the server itself to ask about it. But if I ask the Node.js app, it's gonna give me these values, right? So here's what I'm going to do next, right? I'm going to do index.js after I run all these, which is I'm not going to run it anymore, right? Because uh, I already store these for an hour. I'm going to just go a loop and read, right? I'm going to create a function that reads. And exactly similar. Uh, YY. P. And then just do a get, right? The get is slightly different. What we're gonna do is not you don't need a value, right? You don't need an expiry date, but it's gonna give you a function, a callback, where it's actually two places, error and data, right? And then we just print the data, because that's what we're interested in. Assume there are no errors here. Again, this is a very simple app here. And then just go ahead and read. So in this case, 
you're talking to the pool directly. You're not talking to individual machines. So we know that the keys were actually evenly distributed between the servers because we telneted into each server and tested that out, right? So now what we're going to do is let's run and see node index.js. Uh, Look at beautiful. Bar 9, bar 2, bar 4, bar 3, bar 6, bar 7, bar 8, bar 1, bar 5. Why do we get the different values? It's very easy because we, we are, we are running asynchronous job. We have no idea. Yeah, we executed foo 1 first, right? But foo, right? We, we, what we did is like we looped and sent all the 10 requests at the same time, okay? Right? All, this is what we did. We looped and sent all these 10 requests. But these are asynchronous. So bar 9, foo 9 might get, give us a result before foo 8, right? All of these are just, this is how Node.js works. It's a single threaded and it sends all these requests and just loops through the, its main, uh, the, the main loop, uh, the, the main thread loop, right? And it looks for the result. It depends on the server how fast it's going to respond, right? So it's going to send all these things and then, hey, the server responds for this, responds for this, for this, for this. We'll just do all this stuff. So the client here, it really depends what it does as well, right? So the client really depends on this. It took the hash, right, of the full one, determined the full one should exist on this server, connected to the server, asked for the value, pulled that value, and then returned it. So you have no idea how fast these servers will reply, right? And the number of connections to each server also really matter, right? So that's basically uh, it for the demo, guys. I uh, kind of explained all this uh, idea of Memcached. Let's go ahead and summarize this course. All right, we did the demo. Let's summarize. We talked about memory management. Memory is a fragmented. If we didn't do the slab pages concept, then we're going to be allocating values left and right, right? And that, as a result... Uh, becomes fragmentation and the fragmentation is bad because now you have all these beautiful gaps of free space that we cannot use unfortunately right because our items might not necessarily fit these gaps right so we need memory management lru again uh, a very an unpopular opinion i i would like for this to be an option to be disabled so that i don't get locked right and keep my application simple and if someone wants to build an RU, why don't they build it themselves, right? Or just have the client have the control. I wish they stayed simple and didn't implement this. Just that's just my only dis criticism of the Memcached. They they stayed simple. They stayed to their rules. This is, to my, in my opinion, I think it's an overkill, right? Threads. I love this design. Yeah, we can work with money. Threads, of course. Uh, there is a limit for the. There is another problem with the thread design here, is that let's assume you have multiple threads, right? And uh, each thread is a connection, right? Let's say about that, right? And and when we looked at the data, I think when we looked at the stat, we thought that there is a fixed number of threads, right? And I don't know if this, if Memcached share connections on a given thread, like have multiple connections on a thread. I don't know that. Maybe, because otherwise it's going to run out of threads, right? So in this case, what you, you, you can end up with is a thread with a connection that happened to have a very aggressive client, a client that sends a lot of data to this thread, you know? So in this particular thing, you create a bottleneck, and that bottleneck, really there is no solution to it because you don't know if a connection is going to be aggressive or light, wait, right? You can, you can change that complete model to a centralized thread model, where is a th center thread that takes the messages, these requests, and these requests will be distributed evenly, right? You can do that. But then the bottleneck is moved to a single thread. Y you lose either way, right? There is no solution, the best solution. That's when you, when you, when you go into deep these things, like right? it's, it's fascinating to me. I absolutely love it. We talked about read and write, talked about locking, covered distribution cache, which is completely client side. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, crash course, deep dive level into Memcached. Absolutely, uh, I enjoyed researching this. Took me a lot, uh, a month to research this entire course. I uh, absolutely love it. Uh, if you want to support the channel, become a member. There is a lot of uh, member exclusive content in this channel. Uh, if you want to support otherwise, uh, there is the 
there is uh, I have a lot of Udemy courses. Uh, there is discount coupons. Check out check them out, and uh, that supports the channel. Appreciate you so much, and thank you all for your wonderful messages. Hope you enjoy this course. I'm gonna see you in the next one. You guys stay awesome. Goodbye.